I call this meeting to order. Will everybody please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the New Jersey Open Public's meeting law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meeting of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the, with the provisions of this act, the Cedar Grove Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be advertised by having the date, time, and place thereof posted on bulletin boards in the district, published and are transmitted to the Verona Cedar Grove Times and Star Ledger newspapers, tap into online news, filed with the township clerk, and posted on the district's website. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Mrs. Miga. Here. Mr. Splendoria. Present. Mr. Schoner. Present. Mrs. Dye. Here. We now come to the portion of our meeting where we allow members of the public to address the board. In this section, we allow public comments on resolutions only. Our board regulations allot 20 minutes for these communications. Each person shall be limited to three minutes. There will be a countdown timer, and at the end of the three minutes, the microphone will be shut off and the speaker will be interrupted. Speakers may speak more than once only after all others wishing to speak on a topic have been heard. Issues raised by members of the public may or may not be responded to by the board. All comments will be considered and a response will be forthcoming, if and when appropriate. This portion of the meeting is meant to hear public comment, not to have a dialogue between the board and the person speaking. The board asks the members of the public to be courteous and mindful of the rights of other individuals when speaking. Specifically, comments regarding students, district employees, and members of the board are discouraged and will not be resp responded to by the board. The public is reminded that students and employees have specific legal rights afforded by the laws of New Jersey. The board bears no responsibility, nor will it be liable for any comments made by members of the public. Members of the public should consider their comments in light of the legal rights of those affected or identified in the comments and be aware that they are legally responsible and liable for their comments. All statements will be directed to me as the presiding officer, and no one may address board members individually. Please be reminded that if your statement is too lengthy, abusive, obscene, or defamatory, you may be interrupted, warned, or your participation may be terminated. Please also be reminded that if any person does not observe reasonable decorum, is disorderly, or disrupts the meeting, you will be asked to leave the meeting. The board reminds those individuals who take this opportunity to speak to identify themselves by name, address, and group affiliation, if applicable, every time you, if applicable, every time you address the board, and to limit their comments to items on the agenda. The meeting is open to the public for comment on items on the agenda. And we had a sign-up sheet for that portion of the meeting, and nobody signed up, and so I'm going to close that portion of the meeting. Good evening, everyone. How's evening. everybody doing this evening? Very well. Very well. We have a nice, friendly crowd this evening. I we know. Have, yeah, this is, we have some great. presentations. We have oh, a, a lot of presentations. an important resolution. So yep. things are good, right? Anybody attend anything or? Uh, South NFSA. Okay. And uh, not much to report, but with the cohort combining, 93% of the kids are in class. Wow. Five days a week. Very nice. That's, that's been, and they said the kids are ecstatic to be there. I'm sure they are. And the teachers also love having the kids there. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, yes. So the fourth graders will have a uh, promotion ceremony. Great. And they're going to do a drive-by clap-out, which is what they did last year. And uh, they said that actually worked so well last year that they were looking forward to it. Very nice. That was about it. Okay. You didn't attend anything? Really? I'm shocked. Well, I, I will tell you that, you know, well, we are, um, you know, Cedar Grove Waves is planning. We've been talking about next year what we're going to do. And we're also working on um, getting and figuring out some permanent lighting uh, for the building for the, for the flags for that time period and to have the lighting be permanent because it is the 20th anniversary of... Uh, of September 11th, so we're working on working on those details now. Nothing's been formalized just because the lighting is so expensive. Um, but yes, yeah, that's what's going on. Got it. Will you be asking for donations again? Like I you probably will be do, asking or? for donations once we have a sense of it. We've been talking to the lighting companies um, to see if they can donate the lighting. We'll donate the actual fixtures, and um, we're hopeful that will happen. And as soon as we have a sense of what it's going to cost, we may go out for donations again. 
Great. All right then. Ms. Mega. <laughs> Hello. I attended the uh, City Grove High School APT meeting, and I won't steal Mr. Grosso's thunder. I'm I know sure it's like you can't really say anything. I know. Right? <laughs> but I'm sure a lot of it is in there. Um, but project graduation is looking for volunteers for this year's current juniors and sophomores and freshmen who want to run it in the future. Um, they're also still selling signs for graduation, and those signs are for eight, uh, fourth, eighth, and seniors. That sale is going on until May 25th. They also celebrated um, teacher and staff appreciation. I think it was this last week. I think it was last week. It was the week of May 7th, right? Or, was, which was like, they were a little delayed okay. with what they were doing. You know, sometimes volunteers at the high school could potentially be an issue. There's that. Oh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so that was it for them. I also attended, I'm going to speak for Nicole, because Nicole and I are both at the uh, rec, the Recreation Advisory Board mm -hmm. meeting. And the pool will be opening. So pool badges are for sale right now. Pool memberships are for sale right now. And um, they have a bunch of summer programs going on outdoors. And I think that's pretty much it. All right. I, I just was going to say that I think if um, people can buy the, the signs again this year, it was a great it was really a great thing because when you drive through town to yeah, see... Yeah, it's really nice, right? Yeah, you, you, you're yeah. driving past all the houses and you're seeing the signs for, for all the different grades that are getting promoted or graduating and their kid, the kid's name on. It was really nice here, last year under the worst, you know, not a good circumstance. And there's two different sizes. There's a large sign, which I don't want to say what people do or don't do. Um, there's a mixture, but um, there's two different signs for people. And they're, they're for sale through the 25th. After that, I think they're going to cut it because they need time to make them. And deliver them or pick them up or however they're handling that. So you have until May 25th, anybody out there <laughs> who wants to buy a sign. They will if you want. It's a yeah. couple of, I think it's like $5 extra or something, but it's a really nice touch. Yeah. It's great to drive around town and see, and see the signs all yep. over. Yep. That's it for me. All right. Well, I think I attended the district advisory uh, council meeting. I attended the EDAC meeting, uh, both from the subcommittee and the regular one. And I also attended the self meeting. But I'm pretty sure Mr. Grosso is going to talk about all of them. And so I'm going to leave it to you. OK. Are, we, are you talking now, or are we going to do presentations? Or, OK. All right. All right, so we have a few different presentations. Are we going in order? All right. So the first one is the um, 2021 Essex County Student Recognition Program. Uh, and who will be doing that? Um, no. OK. And do we stay up here for a while? Yeah, we'll do that. OK. So now is what you're saying. Let's go down. OK. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Mrs. LaFoon. I'm the Student Assistance Counselor at the high school. Each year, the Essex County Unsung Heroes Program considers students who may have overcome difficult academic or personal challenges, modeled good citizenship, or exhibited a spirit and quiet strength that has inspired others. This includes students that have organized programs that supported local nonprofit charities, volunteered firefighters, EMTs, or those who achieved academic success despite challenges. Lawrence Chin was the first student that came to mind when having to choose a nominee for this recognition award. Through his constant determination and hard work, Lawrence surpasses all of his academic expectations and his teachers are nothing short of impressed. They've shared wonderful things about this outstanding student. Lawrence is a positive individual who is always encouraging his peers and is proactive in his own work. He is the epitome of the student who understands how hard work pays off in the end. In his social media class, he has focused on fitness, promoting healthy, li healthy living, both nutritionally and mentally. He is always sending positive messages out to his followers and even takes the time to remind his peers to study for tests. 
Lawrence is always willing to volunteer in the classroom discussions and makes his classes a better and more fun place to be in. He is also currently in the new Cedar Grove Performing Arts Workshop class. He works hard every day on his studies as well as memorizing lines, all with a smile on his face. Quiet strength is exactly what Lawrence has and it can be seen in his focus on how he lives every moment. Lawrence is also an active member outside of the school. He practices Taekwondo and is now a second degree black belt. He is also a swimmer at the Montclair Swimming Academy and has shown his kindness and spirit not only throughout the school, but throughout his surrounding communities. He is a student leader at Redline Student Ministries, created over 500 baskets of food for the homeless and regularly donates blood for the American Red Cross. He also participates in fundraisers to provide food for children in the group homes. Lauren's goal after graduation is to pursue a career in law so that he can have the opportunity to provide legal advice for those that are underprivileged. Lawrence is an outstanding student and a person who consistently shows empathy for others and continues to work hard towards his academic and personal goals. Lawrence, on behalf of myself, Mr. Bayer, Mrs. Inglis, Mr. Grasso, and the Board of Education members, we would like to congratulate you on your nomination. I'm just saying you guys should not put me in charge of pictures. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Jody Inglis and I'm the assistant principal of Cedar Grove High School. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Danica LaQuesta, president of the Asian Fusion Club, Lana Bernardez, treasurer of the Asian Fusion Club, and Daryl LaQuesta, representative from Memorial Middle School. Danica and Lana are two of the founders of the Asian Fusion Club at the high school. They wanted to give the Asian American population of CGHS more representation. But more importantly, they wanted to educate Cedar Grove students on the variety of cultures within the Asian population. Through word of mouth from her family in California, Lana found out about Hollaback. Hollaback is a global people-powered movement to end harassment and hate. Lana, Danica, and Daryl, along with their advisor, Mr. Gallagher, and administration have attended trainings to stop anti-Asian and xenophobic harassment. Additionally, Lana, along with Cedar Grove and Verona's, Verona's Social Justice Group, will be hosting a Zoom panel tomorrow evening on bystander intervention. These students have already, already affected such a positive change within the walls of CGHS. We are so very proud of them. Please welcome Danica, Lana, and Daryl.
Hi, my, my name is Daryl Acuesta, and I am the Memorial Middle School representative. Good evening, my name is Danica Laquesta, and I am the Cedar Grove High School Asian Club president. Hi, my name is Lana. I'm a junior, and I'm the treasurer of Asian Club. You and I both know that education is invaluable. Danica, Daryl, and I are here to share with you about how you can intervene in anti-Asian incidents amidst the current epidemic in the United States of racism. It is an epidemic that is just as fatal as COVID-19, and it started to spread way before COVID-19 even existed. Daryl, we'll take it away. There you go. Hi, my name is Daryl Acuesta, and I have the honor to present bystander intervention to stop anti-Asian harassment and xenophobia. Daniel Acuesta, Lana Bernardes and I, with the help of Mr. Gallagher, have the honor to share our message. First and foremost, thank you so much to Mr. Breyer and Ms. Inglis to give us this amazing opportunity to come onto the stage today. I would like to start off with the amount of Asian hate crimes since the year 2020. These include physical harassment, verbal harassment, and many more which we will talk about today many of which have not been reported through these past years. But now, uh, we would like to bring it to the spotlight. Uh, Russell Jung, a professor in San Francisco University, has conducted an experiment showing each and every Asian hate crime since the year 2020. It's depicted towards each specific gender. And as you see here, females are picked on most, and it really asks America, is discrimination based on race, gender, or maybe both? AAPI, if you don't know, stands for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. From a racial standpoint, these groups have been affected the most. From the rise of COVID-19, the, the amount of racial stereotypes and slurs have grown, attacking these, these groups. Just like in the 1700s, the Jewish community has been attacked during the Black Death and now in 2020 during coronavirus. Now the government plays a huge role in our lives every single day, from the economy to our laws and now racial discrimination. Some politicians have called coronavirus the Chinese virus or the Kung flu, which kind of changes the mindset of many people to think that coronavirus is a thing of race instead a thing of science. Now, racism has been a hot topic, especially in the year 2020. Many have different perspectives. Some may even have different opinions. But racism often revolves around judging someone not based on the character of their heart, but by the race or ethnic group. Racism opens up many different topics, especially admitting its existence. And now I'd like to invite Danica LaQuesta to come up and share her slides. First of all, I just want to thank you so much to my brother, Daryl, for starting us off on the presentation, and I will be continuing on. So the word harassment and privilege, very different. So harassment meaning aggressive pressure or intimidation, and privilege meaning a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or a group. In our society, there are individuals that do have a privilege, and they know it. Most of the time, they use it for the greater good to help the unprivileged. However, sometimes that is not the case. There are some individuals that are aware of their privilege, and they take advantage of it to harm people who are not given the privilege. Therefore, they will commit harassment. Towards the AAPI community, I will be discussing the statistics on the different types of harassment. So here are the statistics on anti-Asian hate incidences. This is the general statistics. However, as time goes on, or if we're going to discuss about the past, these can fluctuate. So to start off, 68.1% consist of verbal harassment. For instance, if a Chinese woman is walking to a grocery store and a man drives by her and starts rapidly beeping his horn and starting anti-Asian slurs. 20.5% consist of shunning, also known as the complete ignorance of the individual as a human being. 11.1% consisting of physical assault. So physical assault towards the Asian community, you will most likely see in social media platforms 
or on the news, and most of the time you will see very graphic images. 8.5% require, I mean, consist of civil rights violation, and last but not least, 6.8% of online harassment. As time goes on, we actually might see the percentage of online harassment go up, considering that more people in our generation will start to use it because information can easily be go out and easily accessed. An example of online harassment is just as simple as an Asian teenager like me or Lana posting a video on TikTok or on Instagram and some racist, ignorant person commenting racial slurs and also using stereotypes to try to fetishize us and even try to um, humiliate and embarrass us. So now I will be going more into specifics on anti-Asian hate incidences, starting with probably the most recent, most iconic one starting on March 16th, 2021, when Aaron Long committed a series of mass shootings in Gold Spa in Atlanta, Georgia. There were eight victims that were killed and out of eight of them, six of them were, be, were Asian women. Now on the news, people were just saying that his addiction caused him to cause the mass shootings, but either way, that is not an excuse to consider that this can most likely be an Asian hate crime. And out of the victims, all of them had loved ones, and those six Asian women, they had loved ones, they were mothers, they were sisters, and they were even were daughters, and imagine how their families could have felt. And on this news report by CNBC, you can see a man be, who is going to later on attack a 65-year-old Asian woman, a Chinese Asian woman, who was actually on the way to church in downtown Manhattan. In downtown Manhattan, this 65-year-old woman was walking to church until she was approached by this younger, obviously taller, bigger man who just started kicking her and punching her to the ground, yelling anti-Asian slurs. This gave the AAPI community such great fear towards our Asian elders because this was a normal day for her. She was walking to church and then something just tragic occurred. Even um, when this occurred, even similar events that have occurred, many families would want their elders and the older people in their family to try to stay home just because they fear that going outside, people will attack them just by the color of their skin. Police then, say a 65-year-old woman was walking to... Ch now we are going to go back to about 100 years ago when the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed by President Chester A. Arthur. You may have learned this from your United States history class, or you might have just learned it today. So the Chinese Exclusion Act passed by Chester A. Arthur banned Chinese immigrants from coming to the United States of America. Chinese immigrants or Chinese Americans were seen as a threat to America's economy and society. Of course, giving a bad image towards Asians in the United States increased racism. And with the racism, it influences the youth, therefore the youth were experiencing racism as well. Even though, um, these Asian people in America didn't do anything. The U.S. government gave them this bad image that there were threats, therefore people had the mindset of that. This image over here is actually very interesting for me because I actually never seen this image before until I researched upon it. So this is a Filipino tribe in Coney Island, so right by us in the 1920s. Now this Filipino tribe sitting down over here, they may look like they're having a great time around the bonfire, but in reality, they were used as a museum exhibit for white people during this era. As you can see over there, they were um, watching them. They were used as an exhibit and not even considered as human beings, but objects. These people who were watching them would throw food at them. They would start spitting at them and just yelling and mocking them. Of course, this tribe didn't know what was going on because maybe they didn't understand the English language. But little did they know, like the people watching them just didn't take them seriously. Then later on, President Franklin D. Roosevelt made 120,000 Japanese Americans or Japanese descent Americans go into internment camps during the era of World War II. 
the U.S. government feared having a potential spy and going against the government. Now, what is very interesting about the concept of Japanese Americans going to these internment camps is that even though the country Japan was considered the war enemy to the United States, Germany was as well. Did the U.S. government make internment camps for German Americans or people of German descent? No. The reason why they would send them to these internment camps is because we have distinct features and we can easily be controlled into one place. And 120,000 of these people had to leave their homes, they had to leave and close down their businesses, and leave all their friends. Now, with, with, after these people, after the campers left their internment camps, Congress didn't talk about the issue until 40 years later, actually. So later on, Congress thought that, oh, this, what we did to the Japanese Americans in the 1940s was actually bad, so let's repay them. However, this idea only occurred in 1988, about more than 40 years after. And they would give the repays to only the campers that survived. And considering it was 40 years later, most of the people that got repaid were probably young children during this time. And another recent um, example of anti-Asian hate incidences occurred in at the aftermath of 9-11 when members of our South Asian, Sikh, Muslim, and Arab Americans were stereotyped as terrorists after the 9-11 attack. Because of this one event, some ignorant people would stereotype a big community as something bad such as a terrorist and give them an overall bad image. So overall, seeing the incidences happen recently may have been they may have been influenced by the past, and it is very important to keep like, the history of this very accountable and to be aware of it. Now I will be passing on this presentation to Lana Bernardes. Thank you. The number of anti-Asian incidents will continue to increase from 6,600. However, you can do something about this. You may find yourself as a bystander when you go to New York City or you walk around Cedar Grove. A bystander is a person who is present at an event but doesn't take part in it. That's why bystanders need to intervene, which is simply to interrupt a situation and help make it better. Two organizations named Hollaback and AAJC, or Asian Americans Advancing Justice, developed a method to intervene because all of us can intervene, but how? We need a formula for this. We need a concrete, a concrete um, level of steps to do. So these organizations, they made the five Ds and 25% of people intervene in situations. However, 79% of people say that the situation improved. That means bystander intervention works. So I'll talk about the five Ds that both Hollaback and AAJC made to help you know how to intervene in an incident, whether it's an anti-Asian incident or not. Number one is distract. You must help, indirectly help the victim in the situation to de-escalate it. For example, if you see somebody being harassed, you can pretend that you're their friend or you're their mother, father, sister, brother, and you can help them and take them away from the situation. Or you can pretend to drop your coffee or your phone and then take them away from the situation. You can maybe even scream so that all the attention can be on you and you can just pull the victim out of their situation. Number two, delegate. If you can't do anything because you have kids or you just don't think that it's the right time for you to intervene, then you need to get help from other people. So you can talk to the person next to you and say, hey, can you go help that person out? I think there's something going wrong over there. Or you can go to the manager of a store and ask them to help you out and stop the harassment. Number three is document. 
This is taking a photo or video of an incident so that you can record, so that you can have evidence to submit um, to the victim. However, you need to get the victim's permission first and then you can so post it on social media. Number four is delay. After an incident takes place, you can go to the person and check in with them to check in on their mental and physical health. Or you can just stand by them and make sure that they're okay and have a ride home. And the last one is direct. This is when you intervene in a situation with words. You speak up to the aggressor. And before you do this, you must assess your safety because you are obviously putting yourself into this situation. So let's practice. This is an anti-Asian incident that occurred on May 2nd. It's only been two weeks since then. And a 15-year-old Asian American person living in Flushing, New York City, was verbally harassed. And the stuff in quotes, the words in quotes, that's what was said to him. He was called Ching Chong. And then he was beaten after by five teenagers. So in this situation, many of the five Ds can be used. However, I recommend using the D distract because if you take the teenager, if you take the 15 year old teenager out of the situation, you can help him, you can prevent him from be being beaten by the other teenagers and hopefully de-escalate the situation. Or you can use direct whatever floats your boat. Noel Quintana is a Filipino American man. He's 61 years old and he was slashed in the face in New York City on February 3rd. This could have been my grandpa. This could have been your grandpa. So in order to intervene in this situation, I would recommend using delay, which is intervening after the incident occurred by making sure he's okay and he has a ride home or any type of transportation to the hospital. And the last example of an incident is um, the picture on the right. So on May 2nd as well, it's only been two weeks since then, two people, two Asian American people were hammered by this person. In this situation, it's really dangerous, so I would also recommend using the, de the D delay and make sure that these two people who are being hammered aren't, are okay and checking in with them so that they can go to the hospital or they can get a ride home. So the most important takeaway from this presentation is that bystander intervention, it's not a grand act that Superman would do. It's a small yet impactful act that will allow you to help somebody as much as Superman can. And John Lewis was a civil rights activist and politician and congressman of Georgia. He famously said, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? So whenever you find yourself as a bystander of a situation, you must do three things. Number one, breathe. Just breathe in and breathe out. Number two, assess your safety. And number three, think of John Lewis's quote. You have to do this. If not you, then who? Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for Hollaback for educating us on the five Ds and also teaching us the history of anti-Asian hate incidences and what is going on recently and even in the history. And um, over here, we actually have, uh, there's going to be a Lantern Festival in Montclair on Friday. So if you are willing to help the AAPI community or even anyone that just experienced racial justice, it would be great if anyone would like to show their support. It is sponsored by AAPI Montclair. There will be food trucks. There will, it will be family friendly. It will be a great time. And last but not least, here is our bibliography with all of the credible and reliable sources we used. So does anyone have any um, comments or questions before we wrap it up? 
I, th I think the biggest thing is we just want to thank you for um, getting up there and doing the presentation. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy, and it also is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big deal to get in front of everyone and talk about something, especially when you, uh, your community is being, uh, is being victimized in the way. So, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to congratulate Lawrence. It's quite an accomplishment. So congratulations. And I'd like to thank all of you. This is absolutely phenomenal what you presented to us tonight. Not only is it the truth, but you've educated all of us. And those of us who are watching at home um, and tuning in, you're educating them. So I congratulate you. I thank you, sir. And I look forward to the good work that you will be doing as we move forward. So thank you very, very much. And congratulations to the family. You've raised wonderful children. Thank you. In January of this year, Dr. Thomas McCarrick of Vanguard, Vanguard Medical Group reached out to me to offer his support in vaccinating all 256 staff members of Cedar Grove Public Schools. Over the next several weeks, Dr. McCarrick and Dr. Joey Patel were in constant communication with me on vaccination delivery dates and the organization and facilitation of the vaccinations. Staff members of Cedar Grove Public Schools took advantage of this service starting in March. This act of community and kindness moved our district forward, providing safety, peace of mind, and good health, enabling our staff to continue to serve our students. The act also enabled staff who were homebound the opportunity to move back into the classroom to engage their students and provide new opportunities. Cedar Grove Public Schools is proud to partner with Vanguard Medical Group and honored to work with such courageous individuals that have put others above themselves. Without you, we would certainly not be where we are today. Therefore, the Cedar Grove Board of Education presents to you a resolution in honor on this day, the 19th of of the 19th of the, on the month of May in the year of 2021. And to accept this, I'd like to call up Dr. Gorman. I'd like to read, I'm gonna to present, to to present to you a resolution that will be adopted tonight by the board. Uh, these are for um, Dr. McCarrick and Dr. Patel. It says, in recognition of the distinguished service rendered by Vanguard Medical Group, Verona, New Jersey, during the COVID pandemic, whereas in response to the rapid spread of COVID-19, Dr. Thomas McCarrick, Joey Patel, and the Vanguard Medical Group provided medical services to help protect the staff and students of the Cedar Grove School District, District staff, and whereas with a limited supply available, the Vanguard Medical Group extended the opportunity for all staff to receive the COVID-19 vaccines, and whereas the medical group, Vanguard Medical Group, offered COVID-19 tests with rapid results, and whereas out-of-state travelers of the Cedar Grove School District, including students, were furnished with documentation on return to work school status. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Cedar Grove Board of Education extends their gratitude and respect for the medical care put forth by Vanguard Medical Group. And whereas on this, the 19th day of May, 2021, the Cedar Grove Board of Education will vote unanimous, unanimously to adopt this resolution. Thank you.
say just something sure. quick. <clears throat> so I want to thank you for this, uh, this recognition. Tom McCarrick and I uh, inherited the uh, school physician positions in the mid-90s from Bob Bader and Danny Burbank. Now, a few people who have some gray hair might remember them. So when we started, we were in Cedar Grove. Uh, we spent our first 16 years in the Canfield Office Park. And we had a very lively presence here back then. Um, we reached out to the Board of Education because everybody was sort of, you know, sheltered in place. We weren't coming to the school. We are thrilled that in our present location and with our big staff that we're able to, you know, do this kind of help. We're doing a lot of vaccines for children now. We've got a lot of Pfizer vaccines for anybody who's 12 and up. So if you know anybody who's looking for that, reach out to us. They're going like hotcakes. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Superintendent Grosso, board members, parents, students, teachers, staff, public for inviting Right at School to present. Uh, my name is Andrew Cohen. I'm the regional director for Right at School. My partner, sorry, my partner Julie Lyon uh, is joining us virtually. Uh, I am local. I, I live in New Jersey. Uh, I say central New Jersey. You'd say probably way south in Mercer County. Uh, my wife uh, is a teacher at the Katzenbach School for the Deaf for the last 20 years. I have three school-age children. Uh, education is what I do and, and what I believe in. Um, my entire professional career has been spent supporting children and families and districts with partnerships like this. Um, about 11 years ago now, our CEO, Mark Rothschild, walked into his child's uh, after school program and saw her uh, eating Doritos, watching a movie, and he thought, I can do this better. And he has worked tirelessly over the last 11 years to do just that. Uh, as you can see, our vision is to bring exceptional, affordable, extended learning programs to as many students, parents, and schools as possible. Uh, it has really been, in the last year, uh, as we've worked closely with districts across the country to support them, uh, heavy focus on the social emotional, urging, uh, social emotional learning and to close achievement gaps. Uh, our program, we provide uh, before school programs, after school programs, break camps, uh, days off. Uh, we have a special program for our, our middle school, uh, which is really focused on, on uh, you know, the developmental needs of, of those children at that age, a lot of leadership development. We have an academic component, obviously a heavy focus uh, on completing homework, physical, uh, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, the social and emotional learning. Uh, we also really focus on peer learning, community service. Um, children can be junior educators as they learn uh, how to lead their peers. Uh, won't spend too much time on this slide. Uh, it, it shows you know, our, our pricing uh, as we look to, to provide care here. Uh, we are a big believer in flexibility. So you will see here one, two, three, four, five day rates. Families can change that as their needs change. So they can choose five days uh, and then, you know, if something happens with their work, especially in this day of, of working uh, remotely, they can change. There's also drop-in available as well. Um, and so families can uh, choose close to the last minute um, if they really need care to, to have their child with us. 
we have a, a heavy focus on, on hiring, training. So as a regional director, I support all of our programs in the Northeast. Uh, each of our programs has a local area manager. That local area manager spends all their time working with the district, with administration, with principals, with teachers, uh, and really spends time in our programs observing, coaching, uh, training, and developing. <clears throat> each location, each school, each of the three schools would have an on-site program manager. They are responsible for managing the program before care, after care, obviously in close partnership with the area manager. And then, depending on the number of children in each program, we have educators uh, who support. Uh, we follow New Jersey <coughs> child care licensing, so it's a one to 15 ratio, uh, and we follow that uh, at all times. Uh, heavy focus on training and coaching uh, our team. It starts with uh, an onboarding process for all of our new staff, uh, which is done uh, through our online learning system, then an in-person training for three days, and then, as I mentioned, ongoing training. These are just some of the topics we cover. We follow, again, New Jersey child care licensing uh, guidelines for background checks and clearances, uh, and we make sure uh, that that is followed impeccably. Um, we will be hosting a parent forum uh, for parents who are interested. This will be done virtually. Um, as you know, we've sort of moved into a virtual world, hopefully, uh, but we've seen actually a, a, an amazing increase in participation by offering this, so it may be something we even continue on going. Uh, after that, our contact, my contact information, area manager's contact information will be there for anyone with questions or concerns um, at, at any time. And as the regional director, I will also spend time, um, especially as we sort of get underway uh, with the district to make sure that we address all questions, concerns. Thank you. Before I start, I just want to say great job again to our, to our student presenters tonight. Uh, love seeing you put your uh, education to action. So good, e good evening, uh, Board of Education, Mr. Grosso, uh, parents uh, who may be watching or in attendance. Thank you for this opportunity. We're, we're really excited to be here tonight to talk about STEAM. What, we're, what you're going to hear from tonight is really the culmination of about five to six months um, worth of work by, by our STEAM committee standing beside me. And you'll hear from just about everybody in just a moment. But we're going to present tonight on STEAM Pathways at Cedar Grove High School. And hopefully by the end of the, pre the presentation, you'll have a better understanding of what that means. STEAM Pathways are going to have the greatest impacting on our rising freshman class and then all classes moving forward. I want to quickly introduce our Cedar Grove District STEAM Committee. We have myself, Dustin Bear, principal at the high school, Jody Inglis, um, the vice principal at the high school, Ms. Janine Barboza, supervisor of math, science, and business. We have uh, Dave Coster, who's our STEAM teacher here at the high school and doing some great work with our high school students right now. Ms. Erica Sloda, currently our middle school counselor, um, who uh, was a va very valuable member of this STEAM committee, but will also be joining us at the high school next year as a high school counselor. We have Mr. Michael Tedesco, who is our intro, who is our computer science teacher here at the high school. Uh, Mr. Vin Muffrey teaches all of our physics courses, especially our higher level physics courses. It was an outstanding addition to this committee. And then uh, Jeremy Lugameno, who is our STEAM teacher at the middle school. So we really, what I believe is we tried to put together all of our, ste our greatest STEAM minds throughout the district in one room, and we met at least once, if not twice a week for the past five months um, and worked on putting together this presentation, this program that you'll hear about tonight. So what is STEAM? STEAM is an interdisciplinary area of study which integrates the five disciplines, science, technology, engineering, 
art, and mathematics. STEAM allows students to build and develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills by collaborating with peers through the process of identifying and solving real-world problems. STEAM education is at the heart of every medical breakthrough, computer enhancement, infrastructure design, and Etsy shop. Quite frankly, STEAM is everywhere we look. It's in everything we do um, every day you know, throughout, as, as we proceed through our, our week. Now, what is a pathway? So that's STEAM. What's a pathway? A pathway can be defined as a sequence of courses focusing on a specific area of study. Much like at the college level, you would think of a college major or a college minor where you're focusing in, you're honing in your studies on a particular area of interest. High school pathways connect curriculum to careers or areas, areas of student interest through course scheduling, portfolio development, and real world experiences. Some of the benefits of a pathway are that they provide a themed approach to high school education, allow students to demonstrate a commitment to an area of interest, and allow students to exhibit depth of knowledge in a, se in a selected area of study. So why join STEAM? Now I do want to point out that we are piloting the STEAM pathway in the 21-22 school year. We were also in talks with the art department and the business department towards working, about working towards pathways in those areas as well. We chose to go with STEAM because we had the foundation in place. We have, we're doing some, Jeremy's doing some great work down at the middle school with our STEAM students. Dave is doing some outstanding work at the high school. Mike and Vin and some of our other uh, science and math teachers are doing some outstanding work. So we had a platform that we could build from. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistic, STEAM jobs are expected to grow at a rate of 8.8% between 2017 and 2029, creating nearly 800,000 new jobs. In 2019, the median annual wage of STEAM occup occupations was $89,780, which is more than double the median annual wage of non-STEAM occupations at $40,020. As of 2019, women comprised just 27% of the STEAM workforce. The U.S. Department of Education just invested $554 million into STEAM education. And finally, according to Code.org, there were 11,036 open computing jobs in the year 2018 with an average salary of $108,028. Yet, that year, there were, there were only 2,002 college graduates with a computer science degree. What does that all speak to? It speaks to a high demand for, STEM, for, for the STEM workforce, for college graduates who are entering the college workforce, and a low supply job opportunities and job opportunities making well above the average income. At this point, Erica is going to talk to us a little bit about what do college look, colleges look for in STEAM applicants. Good evening. Uh, and taking a look at some of the resources out there and getting some information as to what colleges are actually looking for. There was a ton of information that really helped to guide this uh, committee so that we could see that students were really going to be in a way better position by having a program like this. Uh, the, first and foremost, um, students are going to be able to take a uh, really challenging course load, and that's what, something that colleges definitely look for in their applicants. They want to know that the applicants are challenging themselves, especially in the areas of math and science. Next. Colleges really want to see that students are involved in STEAM activities. Some of these activities already exist. Um, we have the Robotics Club, 3D Printing Club, Robotics Tournaments, Esports, and many more to come. Colleges also look for students who are able to put together a compelling STEAM story through a digital portfolio. Um, this portfolio basically consists of STEAM work and accomplishments that students achieve throughout their high school careers. Some uh, positive personal qualities that, um, that colleges look for are students who know how to work as a team. Are they working well with others? Are they working as 
toward a, a goal that both students have or the entire group has and how are they communicating within that group to achieve these goals. Next is resilience. They're looking for students who focus on accomplishments and I've learned a lot from the STEAM committee and I've learned that failing is a good thing when it comes to STEAM. And when you fail, you learn, you build yourself back up and that's something that colleges are looking for. How many of these students were able to build themselves back up in a way where they were successful in the end and in learning something. Next is that the students are passionate and they're looking to have fun. They're not afraid to try new things and they are completely passionate about what they're learning and changing the world for, to, so it's a better place. Applying can definitely be competitive, but building your STEAM story is something that can definitely make you stand out. Okay, Mr. Luma. Good evening. Um, so we started thinking about the STEAM program and we started talking to a bunch of different colleges and we were hearing all these things. Um, and then we start, then as STEAM teachers, we kind of thought to ourselves, you can spend hours creating the perfect lesson, right, that you think is going to be great. And you present it to the students and within a minute or two, one of the students says, well, why don't we do it this way? And next thing you know, they came up with a lesson that's a hundred times better than anything you could have created and it took them about 30 seconds. So we said, why don't we ask the students? Uh, if we're going to engage the students, uh, we, make, we need to make sure we have some good student um, uh, choice and good student voice in there. So uh, on April 13th, we put out a survey to the 7th and 8th grade students uh, in the school and went out to all the students. And from that, we, we received 72 um, different res results from students. And we simply asked three questions. Our questions were, is STEAM an area that you would like to pursue in high school? To kind of find out from the responses we were getting, is this someone who even is interested in STEAM? Um, what areas would you be most interested in? And then what STEAM related topics would you like to explore in more detail? So these were our results. Um, we had 62% of the students said that maybe they'd be interested in. 20% said yes. So we were really excited about that. But even the maybes was exciting. Our students know what STEAM is. They, 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 they start in fifth grade in the middle school and they go from fifth grade to eighth grade. They go through a lot of different things. Um, but is it something maybe they can do in the future? So we looked at the results and we saw that um, a lot of the results were things that we were already doing in the middle school, right? We do 3D design. Every student does 3D design. We do robotics. Um, we do engineering design. Um, computer programming we're doing. And then the really exciting was, one was cybersecurity because that's not something necessarily we really go into a lot, but it's something that students were saying they were interested in. Um, some of the other things you'll see that students were interested in were drones, uh, product development. That one was exciting, especially I know some people over here were super excited to see product development. Uh, climate change and renewable energy, those are other things that we cover. Cryptocurrency, I was super excited to see that because I think that we have a real opportunity there to start getting our students interested at a young age in that, uh, as well as video game and app development and space in the universe. So really our goal was just to have, um, see what the students wanted and with this we were able to really then break it down and see what we want to do in the future. Um, so this was a great part of our entire presentation. Okay, so the next question that we wanted to uh, investigate was how can a STEM pathway help students? Uh, and we came up with a few different ideas. Number one is that uh, we would provide careful scheduling for the students who are uh, participating in this cohort. Um, we want to help them build the most challenging schedule that we can so that they do stand out and so that they're challenging themselves and they're learning as much as they possibly can before getting to the college level. Next, we have really dedicated teachers. I've learned that from this committee um, in general. Uh, they have an expertise in the content areas re uh, relative to STEAM. I learned a lot just from being on the committee, so I know that our students are really in good hands. They also can assist with building a digital portfolio. If we 
investigate what colleges are looking for, then we can definitely help the students build that portfolio so that they're in a really great position when it's time for them to apply to various schools. Next is that we have um, many people who are interested in being club advisors, and they are constantly talking about creating new opportunities for students to pursue. Um, I've been learning about the different clubs that the high school has to offer in terms of, um, that are STEAM related, and again, by being on the committee, a number of those opportunities, of new opportunities were mentioned, and we're hoping that they can come to fruition uh, within the next you know, few years. Next is exposure to content areas. Um, students can build their interest in various areas. So this pathway allows them to be exposed to different topics, different classes, and they can take from those classes what they find to be the most interesting, um, different topics and such. Um, and this would help students, you know, more to solidify what they think that their major might want to be. A lot of students go into school and they say to themselves, oh, I'm going to go undecided or I'm going to have a general major. And it takes them a couple of years to determine what they are interested in. By having this exposure to the various content areas, students are able to really have more insight as to what area they'd like to go into. And once they get to the college level, they might be able to select a major sooner rather than later. And last but certainly not least, uh, not least, students are able to collaborate with students that have similar interests. You know, we have students who enjoy band, who enjoy sports. Um, and having students who are looking to, who are all interested in STEAM and STEAM-related topics is really great because as we've learned, students learn from one another. They learn from making mistakes. They learn, they learn from collaborating. And this is really gonna give them a wonderful opportunity to do so. Good evening, everyone. I am very excited to be talking on behalf of the group about the behind the scenes, all the many steps that we took to allow the STEAM pathway to come to fruition. Uh, I will tell you that this list here, the schools we reached out to, the colleges, universities, networkings, it's actually just a small fraction of the conversations and the meetings we had. Um, but it's interesting to know all the multiple angles um, that, that we considered when putting this together. Um, I, I do want to bring your attention on this list of schools to the STEM Academy in Orange, New Jersey. About a month ago, we had a Zoom session with Dr. Tina Powell, the K-12 math science supervisor in Orange School District, who shared her incredibly inspiring story of how she built a STEM school from the ground up. And the thing I want to add with the schools is when you are bringing in a new program, new opportunities, what do you do? You look and see what school districts are doing it and doing it well. And this was absolutely a school district that was doing it well. She shared with us the, um, the beginning stages, the panels, the experts she brought in, the, the courses, the programming, the schedule. It was very, very informative. And she also credited a, a group called Project Lead the Way with the success of her program. And I'll, I'll mention that in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, we reached out to Montclair State University. Their PRISM program, which is the network for math and science teachers, allowed us to connect with inventors and engineers in the state of New Jersey, including Harry Roman, a renowned inventor. He has 12 US patents, and he is a member of the Edison Innovation Foundation. One of the things that he spoke about in our meeting was really getting rid of the silos of education, which we have been talking about. It's been a theme where you want to blur the lines between the disciplines, and that's what STEAM does. He spoke specifically about taking engineering and blending it into the areas of business, manufacturing, and more. So it was all very, very interesting. Uh, the other resource that we will be tapping into a little bit more is our own graduates who are in the field of engineering and also studying engineering. Um, they are able to provide us with a lot of feedback constructively about how Cedar Grove prepared them, but also some things that we might want to consider down the road. Now, I have to tell you, Two days ago, I had a conversation with a graduate um, recently. She's, she's, I think she's still in her freshman year, actually. She's one of only four females in a cohort of 30 who are in a physics and biology program with the intention 
of all pursuing a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And I asked her, I said, what's your ultimate goal? And she said, first, I really just want to help people. And Mr. Lugameno stresses a lot, and as did the other teachers, that STEM is humanity, right? So I was so taken back and touched that she said that. But she said, I also want to design and develop prosthetic organs. I said, wow, this is the future. We are here. And I thought of her, and I said, if we have a student who just graduated Cedar Grove High School, and she's there, imagine how much further we can push our students if we start this at, at a younger, at, at, in the younger grades in middle school, and then we continue in the STEAM pathway. So it was, it was an impromptu conversation, but I was so blessed that we had it. So in the last few years, Cedar Grove High School has brought in several dual enrollment opportunities for our students to get college credit for a, a variety of subject areas. And so with the STEAM pathway, we would intend to expand our partnerships with other universities, specifically NJIT, which is another, uh, we spoke to several representatives from this, this college, and they shared with us information about what their dual enrollment looks like, specifically in the 11th and 12th grade. And the last group that we spoke to very recently, about a week ago, was Project Lead the Way. This is an, a nonprofit organization that supports staff and students K-12 in the areas of engineering instruction. In the elementary world, it's called Launch. In middle school, it's Gateway. And then when they get to the high school, the pathways break into three branches, computer science, engineering, and biomedical. This is a, a renowned program that is absolutely something that we would want to consider down the road when we are taking this STEM pathway and, and building up STEAM, right? It's gonna build up STEAM and, and we're gonna take the students to the next level. Um, so this is something that we could consider for you know, the whole, whole, whole district. A lot of things on the plate, but I think that all of the, the contacts and the communication that we had was really ju to just find and research the best opportunities for our students so that when they leave here, they are the ones that are gonna make the world a better place. Thank you. All right, so now that you have an understanding of um, the direction that we're trying to go, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, spend some time and talk about what is this going to look like at Cedar Grove High School, the actual nuts and bolts of it. What you're looking at right now, <laughs> excuse me, is a progression chart uh, for four years for a Cedar Grove, Grove High School student who wants to join the STEAM pathway. Currently, the vast majority of our electives at the high school are full year electives. Um, and there are five credits. What we're going to ask is that students who join the STEAM pathway, they're, they're going to enter into two semester electives. These are going to be foundational electives, STEAM engineering and STEAM intro to computer science. Freshmen have room to take one full year elective. That will be their elective for, fresh, for, for that year. In sophomore year, students will determine if they're going to go through the engineering sequence of the STEAM pathway or the computer science sequence of the STEM of the STEAM pathway. Students in engineering uh, will in sophomore year will go on to engineering two. In junior year, they will go on to engineering three. Students who go the direction of computer science will move on to STEAM AP computer science principles in their sophomore year and then on to STEAM AP computer science A in their junior year. All STEAM Pathway students will come back together in their senior year for a course that we're calling STEAM Product Design, which is the capstone course, and Mr. Muffrey will talk about that in just a moment, where students will have the opportunity to do field experience, uh, uh, experience and develop a product, and uh, I'll let Mr. Muffrey uh, speak to that a little bit more. As uh, Ms. Barboza was speaking, we're actively looking right now at dual enrollment opportunities, especially down the engineering sequence, because students who do the computer science sequence have the opportunity to earn college credit in those AP courses in sophomore and junior year through high scores on their AP exams. So we are looking for dual enrollment in the engineering sequence, but also in computer science as well, because there is the possibility of doing dual enrollment in AP courses. All right, so I'll hand it off to Mr. Coster to speak about engineering. 
Good evening, everyone. How you doing? Hi. Um, so I know that you're looking at the STEAM team. I took that from uh, Mr. Bayer, the STEAM team uh, up here. But uh, what those of you at home and those of you on this side of the auditorium may not realize, everyone uh, sitting on that side of the auditorium could be joining our STEAM team because it's because of the Board of Education making significant uh, investments in the STEM education in our district is the reason that we have this. So this is more of a return on your investment, is what I feel like. And I'm, I'm just very, very thankful that you're giving the students this opportunity and you're giving us the opportunity to uh, teach these really awesome courses. Uh, so I'm going to be teaching some of the, um, the STEAM education courses, STEAM Education uh, uh, Engineering 1, 2, and 3. But I'm not going to go into the details of what's in each course, because as you're going to hear uh, many times tonight, STEAM, STEM is very, very fluid. It, it's a bit of everything. And uh, thankfully, in the last few years, we've put those things in place that we can offer our students the opportunities to do things like um, investigate the engineering essentials, talk about the engineering design process, and actually go through that design process, uh, the technical, uh, uh, complete with technical drawings, prototyping, 3D modeling, and printing. That's kind of like what the students are doing in our engineering one classes. But those of uh, students who are going to join our pathways are going to take that to the very next level. And what we're going to do is we're going to then go into more of a manufacturing, our, invent, our invention versus innovation uh, studies, and then really get into those career opportunities. When I ask my students who wants to be an engineer, I see almost all the hands raised. So I said, OK, what, what do you have to do to get there? And, that, 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 and that's the end of that conversation. So we want to make sure that the students know exactly what they need to do, what their responsibilities are, how to put themselves in the driver's seat. Additionally, some of the things that we want to accomplish through these uh, pathways, we want, I want to add a lot more of the coding aspect. Mr. Uh, Mr. Tedesco and I are going to be able to be, work with students in semester courses, so they may have just had his coding class. They can add that now to uh, our engineering course, which we currently have available for the students to take advantage of, but I would say about a handful in each of my classes takes advantage of, of those opportunities. Uh, we're going to uh, really um, uh, infuse the principles and elements of design I had to thank our very, very patient art department for helping me through that when I'm teaching my STEM design, especially uh, Mrs. Bentley has been uh, remarkably generous with her time and her resources so that, that I can bring in some of those uh, design concepts into my STEM design classes. And uh, if you uh, have an opportunity to, to look at the um, art show out there, you'll see a lot of my uh, engineering students entered the art show this year uh, from invitation from Ms. German and Ms. Bentley. So I thought that was very, very cool. We're going to infuse more of the science and mathematical concepts, really get this into a STEAM more than just an engineering. We're not going to work in silos. And something that Mr. Uh, Tedesco and I feel extremely passionate about, and that's encouraging the participation for the underrepresented populations. Specifically, specifically our female populations, we go out and we actively recruit students for our classes. I remember three years ago making a lot of phone calls to a lot of mothers and saying, I need you to get her to sign up for the class. And I was very thankful for, uh, for the cooperation with the parents in doing that. Um, so I want to pass this off to Mr. Tedesco so we could talk a little bit about the computer science pathway. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us tonight to make this presentation. Uh, and thank you uh, to the vision of the Board of Education uh, for Four years ago, uh, starting up a computer science class in the high school. I don't have a job without that, and I uh, am forever indebted. And it's actually something that I just absolutely love. I'm extremely passionate about uh, computer science and STEAM in general. Uh, so it's really neat to be here and try to boil down what I do, what I've done in the last four years, into one slide. This is going to be great. Uh, so students taking the uh, computer science pathway uh, they'll be exposed to a lot of different things. Uh, computer programming, of course, is one of them. Uh, everybody walks in, thinks that they're going to code the next uh, Madden game or something like that, but they slowly learn that, you know, that it's a step-by-step -step process. We develop these skills. And by the end, I'm always blown away by the projects that the students turn out. Software engineering is going to be a, a focus specifically for uh, the STEAM pathway as well. Uh, game and app development, those are just some things that I saw on the middle school survey and I was like, cool, we do that already. I'm excited about that. Uh, cybersecurity is uh, one of the bigger ones. That 
is a, a field that, is, that has so much demand and not enough um, talent being churned out by the, uh, by the colleges. They, um, there's so many open jobs and so many jobs that have such high starting salaries. You know, I uh, was able this year in my advanced topics class to start a, a cybersecurity uh, unit and just seeing, hearing feedback from the students uh, and telling them, you know, kind of, you know, un, you know, to the side, like, hey, you know, we're thinking about starting the STEAM path. They're like, no, this is what I wanted to do my whole high school career. So exposing them to that, hopefully that'll send them as they go into uh, higher education um, down that pathway. But I'm really excited that we can actually have, a, you know, dedicated classes to start introducing these things to the students. And also animation, they, you know, um, animation is such a big key of, uh, uh, computer science and STEAM in general, obviously with the arts. I always get asked about the languages, so I just threw that in there. Uh, Python, JavaScript, Java, those are the three mains that we'll be looking at, but I always leave it up to student choice, and student choice really kind of goes back into what we look at as well, because STEAM is constantly changing. Like Mr. Coster said, it's, in, it's, oh, it's fluid, we don't know um, what the next big technology is. So our classes will have room for that open-ended aspect of computer science. We had no idea. When I started a few years ago, Mr. Lugamano, cryptocurrency was, you know, what was that? You know, it's, it's like, this is something interesting. Uh, and now it's an emerging thing with Bitcoin and Dogecoin. Is that how you say? Dogecoin. Um, so, and what it's gonna look like in two years, three years, even next year, I, we don't know. So leaving open to student choice, uh, just in terms of topics is, is key as well. But also with languages, I, I love leaving things open to the students that, you know, you, you give a student a couple of concepts and then they, they can really run with it. I've seen uh, students just go home and like, I give them like a little assignment and then they go home and they start doing some research and they start playing around with some things and all of a sudden they're returning to me something that's like, uh, I don't even know how to grade this. This is just like, this is so beyond what I was looking for. It's incredible. So student choice is going to be key. I, I would believe in all of our STEAM pathways here. And obviously um, they're gonna be developing these things. I think uh, we, we have some returning champions from my uh, back to school nights through the years here uh, sitting with us in, in the board for sure. Uh, 21st century skills is something that I always harp on. Um, they're going to learn things in a STEAM pathway that are so key, uh, even if they don't pursue computer science, even if it's not something that they're going to focus on you know, in their adult life, they're going to learn skills like critical thinking, problem solving, reasoning, analysis, perseverance, planning, uh, adaptability. That comes from Nothing that you ever do in these classes ever really goes the way you want it to, and that's good. You know, we want them, we, we, uh, Ms. Barbosa mentioned before, we want them to fail. You know, like this is, this is a good thing uh, because it makes them better people. You know, you have to constantly be thinking on your feet, using your imagination, using your creativity, your artistry. There's so many students that have come out of their shell like, that I've seen taking some of my classes that I, didn't, I wasn't sure how they would take to uh, a computer programming class, and all of a sudden, they're designing these incredible animations and graphic, uh, creating different sprites for video games, and I'm like, wow. Like, and they're, they're so super pumped about what they're doing. Um, and also, as Mr. Coster mentioned, fostering creativity, collaboration, and inclusivity. Inclusivity uh, being the key uh, one there. Uh, we want to make sure that these it's, I, I've, I've sat in a, a bunch of computer science summits through the years, and they always talk about how it's, a, how it's a boys club, and so many issues in computer science, um, particularly with facial recognition, uh, things that impact our lives daily, um, they're underrepresented by different genders and minorities, uh, in particular facial recognition, it was a, uh, there was, an, there was a problem for a long time where it was misidentifying people um, that were African American. And uh, sometimes in some cases not recognizing them as human, that's not, that's nobody's fault. It wasn't done maliciously, but it just, there's not enough representation there. So a main focus uh, for my next few years uh, in the high school, and I'm, again, I'm extremely happy to be teaching this and being able to bring this to other students, 
is to make sure that underrepresented um, populations are included in this STEAM pathway and they can unlock new opportunities that maybe they never considered before. And on that note, I'm going to step away and give it to Mr. Muffery. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so the capstone course is kind of the culmination where they'll get to use all the skills that they've developed in all these nice courses we've heard about tonight, as well as math and business and all the other things, to solve a problem and actually do something real with what they've learned. Uh, what they'll experience is pretty similar to what I did for 10 years as an engineer in industry, uh, two years in luxury sport fishing yacht design and manufacture and eight years in high rise elevators. Uh, major difference is they will not be collecting a salary, um, but you know, you'll have the whole thing, they'll have to identify a problem, they'll have to kind of figure out a solution for the problem, have to refine that solution based on feedback from, you know, manufacturing, um, you know, product testing, you know, things like that. They'll have to do the market studies, produce, you know, the marketing as far as trying to, to, to sell it to people, you know, aesthetics, logos, all the cost accounting that goes with it, and it's going to be profitable, things like that. So it's, it's the whole engineering process you would expect to have, you know, but just it's, you're not getting paid for it. Although we'd get enrolling up if they did. Okay. Uh, some of the potential for this, I mean, it, it's wide open. And right here in Orange, we had a school where they redefined a, a pediatric cochlear implant, and that was the STEM Academy that Mrs. Barboza talked about. They did that. Uh, there's a custom wheelchair for a toddler out in Missouri they did. Uh, another school took e-waste and kept it out of the waste stream so all those precious metals didn't get just buried and all that heavy metals didn't pollute the water by making 3D printers out of it. So, I mean, there's, there's great things that can be done. These students can do wonderful things here in Cedar Grove. They just need to have the opportunity and we just need to give them the support and we'll see great things happen. Okay, so after hearing about this, um, you know, we're hoping that students are interested in now signing up for this uh, STEAM pathway. As I said, we will be piloting this program with the rising freshman class tomorrow. We're sending a condensed version of this presentation out tomorrow morning. It's already recorded. Mr. Coster is going to splice it up for us and, and we'll send it out. Ms. Slota will send it out in the morning. There will be an enrollment form attached for current eighth graders. The deadline for them to complete the form is next Thursday, the 27th at 3 p.m. Students who indicate that they want to join the STEAM pathway, they will be dropped from their previously requested elective and we will instead add STEAM engineering and STEAM intro to computer science. There's also an opportunity in the form for students to select, I'm interested but I need more information. Ms. Slota will then reach out to those students and their parents and help them make um, a final decision on scheduling. So again, if the question is scheduling related, please reach out to Ms. Slota at the middle school. If it's anything other STEM related, any one of us, um, you know, you can certainly reach out to with questions. Mr. Coster, we'll touch on how else we can get involved. So even though, even if you decide not to join the STEM uh, STEAM pathway, which you should really uh, join, uh, there are some opportunities that you can still uh, uh, practice some of these skills and have a lot of fun here at the high school. We have a 3D printing club, which I can announce tonight that we're actually going to have a parents' night with the 3D printing club. We're going to have a night event where we're going to go over a live night event where we're going to invite the parents to have it out on the TV, talk about the different types of uh, 3D printing that we have available at the school, and allow them to send in files to get printed and sent to their house. So I think it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, that's, that's something I'm just announcing for the first time tonight. Uh, we had a robotics club, and how do you do a robotics club virtually? Well, we found out, we found out how to do that, and we competed in two seasons of our robotics uh, club. Did amazing our first one, and our second one we are in the top 20 on the East Coast uh, for, uh, for the March ones. So I was very, very proud of the kids. Uh, uh, the um, board is sponsoring an eSports club, which we're very interested, uh, we're very excited about uh, starting that, but also including those eSports in, um, in our cycles, uh, in, in our electives as well. And then there is interscholastic robotics competitions, which didn't happen this year live, but we have um, uh, plans to join some of the, um, the in-person robotics competitions through not only the robotics club, but through the engineering robotics two course. And then, um, mm -hmm. Last year, we made a ton of props. The STEM design classes and the engineering robotics class 
I think we had a whole month where we were just making swords and Peter Pan uh, gears and everything. I mean, when you have a steampunk Peter Pan, it's right up our alley. So uh, we're always looking for other opportunities. Uh, and uh, teachers are coming to us all the time. Uh, history classes are going over some famous inventions. And a student asked if they can like, build a cotton gin in our class. I said, yes, you can. Come on in. So we're always looking for ways of uh, getting kids excited about the program, bringing them into the STEM lab. So again, thank you very much for your time. And I really do appreciate all the support that you've given this program. La la last, I just want to again thank uh, the Board of Education, Mr. Grosso, for continued support of STEAM at Cedar Grove High School. And I want to thank individually, th personally thank you know, our STEAM team here. I've learned so much from the past five months from you guys about this field and just your passion. I think the hardest problem we had was keeping our meetings to one hour because there's just so much passion in, in, in one meeting. So thank you all. Thank you. Same thing. There you go. Get underneath there. The backdrop. So I was listening to the, the presentation and I must have jotted down, I don't even know how many notes um, because it was uh, such a great presentation. So just a couple things I want to say. As Mr. Tedesco had said, it was only five years ago that the only computer class or anything in STEAM related, um, we had one class five years ago and it was intro to um, computer programming. So that was pre-Mr. Tedesco. Um, I think my record, okay. Um, and and at, in all actuality, there was more being offered at STEAM in the middle school than there was at the high school. And uh, that didn't seem right because you had all these amazing opportunities at the middle school and then you got to the high school and there was nothing. So uh, so it's amazing that, uh, that what we have done in just you know five years. So um, my daughter has actually had the benefit of having each member of the STEAM team in all actuality. And uh, she's a far better person as a result of being with all of them. Um, she fails better as a result, I think, of all of them as well. Um, it was interesting, I was actually on a college tour today with my daughter and uh, they talked about uh, the capstone project and that's the culmination of what they do in their senior year and they talked about these interesting projects that they do every year and, uh, and it's just, you know, you talk about this now and it's just so incredibly relevant. Um, and it was interesting because there was one story about how they were saying like in, in one year, and I, I'm sure I'm going to mess this up with my daughter, but they were talking about how they made a hand that moves. And as Mr. Costner knows, my daughter's like, oh yeah, I'm doing that with an Adreno thing now and I've built it and it can move and, and I, it was just amazing. And that's all because of the experiences that she's gotten from all of you that you know, she could step up and, and talk about things that they're doing in college that she's doing here at Cedar Grove High School. Um, and then one other thing I just wanted to point out, you talk about um, calling the moms and getting people to, to you know, try to be part of the programs. On the, on the college tour we went on today, I don't know, maybe there were like 10 students, and we were excited because we actually got to go on a tour, which you know, is, is new. Um, and I looked around and I said to Ellie, I said, do you notice anything about the whole group that you're a little bit different than the entire group? And she looked around and she's like, I'm shorter. 
So really what it was is she was the only one who identified as female in that group. So, uh, so we still have a little ways to go, but, uh, but it was you know, pretty amazing. So I want to thank all of you because we wouldn't have been on that college tour and we wouldn't have been talking about engineering or the amazing things, the projects that she's doing if she hadn't had each one of you. So thank you. And she's going to completely not be happy with me for mentioning any of this. So. <laughs> I, I, I just she left. <laughs> I was going to say, I remember us having this conversation, um, you know, five years ago, and we were talking about that and how to figure out the budgeting and how to how to make it work, and that that had to that had to be switched up. It was an interesting uh, time. I actually mentioned on the college tour today, you know, being on the board, that every year we've tried to add an additional class just to keep you know the momentum going and to keep the program going, so the students have something new to advance to each year. So. And now this, this is great. You know, I actually told my daughter, I'm like, you're a little ahead of the curve. You should, you know, you should be about three years younger. <laughs> You'd just be getting in. So, so anyway, thank you. We really, really appreciate it. I do have one question. What happens if you don't start as a freshman and you, and you decide sophomore year, you hear from your friends. This is cool, right. Took it freshman year, right? And, oh, this is... Right, have you missed the boat right? Yeah, have you missed on? the boat already? Right, right. right. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, you know, we talked about that, and that's, um, there, I think there will be opportunities. You know, next year we're, gonna, we're rolling it out, we're phasing it in. Um, so I believe there will be opportunities uh, for students to join, to join in. We don't want to turn kids away. This is about, right, it's like inclu inclusion, right? We want more kids in, we want to you know, bring kids in. We don't want to be pushing away, so we're certainly not looking to do that. We have to talk about, are they going into the freshman courses and kind of building up from there? You know, the idea is to get them to the capstone because that's the culminating course. So we would want to find a way to where do we start them off so that they are prepared so when they get to that capstone project, they have all the tools that they need. To yeah, not in over their heads. Yeah, sorry. I don't yeah. think the answer is no. I think the answer is yes. It's just how, do you do how. It? and we have the next year or so to figure that piece out. Very good. I just got a message from her, so I'm just going to stop talking now. <laughs> We're going to move on. <laughs> I think there's a superintendent update, right? That's it. That's it. Um, I, I just have to say this. I mean, this has been a pretty phenomenal night, you know, watching what has, has taken place here. And I, I have to share with all of you, when I'm watching you up here talking about all these, these different areas, this is truly what collaboration is, and this is truly what caring for kids is about and providing opportunities. You've heard me say this so many times about opportunities for children and this is very exciting because you're watching everybody that came up to this podium tonight had an area of specialty and you didn't work in isolation. You're working collaboratively together and quite honestly that is the only way that we move forward. So when we talk about progressive and pro providing opportunities this is all because of you. So I have to tell you I am extremely impressed uh, I cannot wait to see where this is going to go because I, I got to be honest with you. What, while you're talking about this, I I was interested in, in, in just being part of that and, and looking and seeing like, wow, wh where is this going to go? As a student, I would have totally uh, gravitated gravitated towards this. So I commend you all for your work. And I know this this I know this work is not easy work, and I know this is. Um, I like the fact that you talked about failure. That is extremely important. In our society, failure is always looked upon as if it's the end of the road for us. But quite honestly, it's just the beginning. So I really commend you all for that. I thank you for that. And I'm really excited to see what you're going to do in the, in the, in the coming months and years ahead. So thank you very, very much. Um, I, have a, I have an update, so I'm going to go through, um, through several different uh, areas. I'll give you a COVID update. And there's just a lot of new information that has just come out recently this week. Um, and as recently as four o'clock today. So on May 17th, the governor, Governor Murphy placed in, into effect Executive Order 241, eliminating mask requirements in outdoor spaces. To clarify this executive order and what it means for public schools, the following is stated. Individuals in outdoor public spaces are not required to wear masks, regardless of their ability to maintain six feet of distance from other individuals or groups, and regardless of their vaccination status. Paragraph one of executive order number, this is number 163 is hereby rescinded. So paragraph 12 of executive order 239 in paragraph one of executive order 192, they are hereby suspended, uh, that they conflict with the provisions of the order regarding masking in outdoor public spaces. 
employers and entities are permitted to impose stricter requirements regarding mask wearing in outdoor settings for employees, customers, guests, etc. The provision executive order 239 requiring six feet of distance between attendees at an outdoor gathering with certain limited ex uh, exceptions remain in effect. Number two of that order, in addition for purposes of paragraph one of this order, outdoor, this is in quotes, outdoor public spaces do not include child care centers, other child care facilities, youth summer camps, and public, private, and parochial program, preschool program premises, and elementary and secondary schools, including charter and renaissance schools, which continue to be governed by Executive Order 149, 175, 237, and applicable standards issued by the Commissioner of the Department of Health. So as provided in Executive Order 192, all individuals shall continue to wear face coverings in indoor workplaces, subject only to exceptions that have previously existed. Therefore, masking of individuals on school property will remain in effect until further noticed. That, I felt that's a lot of numbers and a lot of orders, but that it's important for us to understand because I've received a lot of questions. I know the principals have received a lot of questions about what does this decision mean as it was uh, shared out this week. It was clearly stated with those provisions, and you can also go on to uh, the uh, New Jersey Department of, uh, well, the New Jersey, the, under the governor's uh, page, under executive orders, and, and look at that. I will also be sending something out to our, um, our families and our caregivers, uh, detailing that, that out as well. In the arena of extracurricular sports, New Jersey Department of Health provided a document including the revised policy on outdoor masking. That applies to extracurricular sports activity, activities even when they are performed on school property. Existing requirements and recommendations for masking in K-12 settings, such as classrooms, gym classes, activities during school hours, that remains in effect. High school sports activities under the jurisdiction of the New Jersey Interscholastic Athletic Association, the NJSIAA, must abide by NJSIAA protocols which shall consider NJDOH guidance. Social distancing shall be followed by all athletes when not actively participating in activity, coaches, referees, trainers, and spectators in both indoor and outdoor settings regardless of vaccination status. Athletes when not actively participating in activity, coach, um, I think I just read that thing. Sorry, there's so much here. Okay, uh, minimum masking and social distancing standards for outdoor extracurricular activities and outdoor events on such prop on, on school property, including outdoor graduation ceremonies and other end of year school events, are governed by paragraph one of executive order number 241. On May 17th, Governor Murphy lifted the travel restrictions on all individuals entering New Jersey. As of today, the New Jersey Department of Health has provided school guidance on this issue as follows. Unvaccinated students and staff should continue to follow CDC recommendations for quarantine and testing after travel. If they test positive, they should isolate and follow COVID-19 exclusion criteria outlined in the NJDOH recommendation for local health departments for K-12 through schools. Students and staff currently quarantining under the now rescinded travel advisory should be permitted to continue doing so. Vaccinated students and staff returning from pre-arranged domestic travel on or after May 17th of this year should no longer be asked to quarantine, but should self-quarantine for COVID-19 symptoms and isolate and get tested if symptoms develop. So it's a lot to swallow. But that is exactly what has come out today. We were waiting for guidance. Uh, when, the, when the 17th rolled around and we, we, we received the order from the governor, uh, local health departments were unclear as to how this were, were, was going to move forward. Therefore, that information came to us today through the Department of Health the School Guidance, which the last document that came out was March 23rd. So this is our most current one based on masking and travel. Again, I will be placing all this out to the community in a communication and I'll be putting it out in my Monday phone calls that everybody loves to receive in their homes. <laughs> uh, Pride Month. In a continuing effort to have each of our students see themselves reflected, recognized, and acknowledged in our instruction, our staff will be provided with an information and resource document on Pride Month, which is, which is observed throughout June. June is a time to celebrate our dynamic lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning plus LGBTQ plus community. Raise awareness of quality services and foster a dialogue to promote healthy, safe, 
and prosperous school climates and communities for all. In 2019, New Jersey became the second state to pass a law requiring public schools to incorporate an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum into their classrooms. Tonight, the Cedar Grove Board of Education will take a progressive step in moving equity and diversity forward in our school community. Tonight, the Cedar Grove Board of Education will make a historic decision to publicly acknowledge our LGBTQ plus community and all those who will in the future be part of our public school community. Tonight, the Cedar Grove Board of Education will take a step forward in solidifying that Cedar Grove Public Schools are a welcoming and safe place for members of our community that belong to the LGBTQ plus community and how we celebrate the differences in our community that makes Cedar Grove Public Schools a better place for all of our students and staff. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a SELC and EDAC update. On June, 20, on June 2nd, the Social Emotional Learning Committee will share a survey with our families and staff about the needs in the area of mental health and social emotional learning. The survey will be available to all staff and families to help guide the district in a direction that will enable progress and address specific needs within our community. The survey will be available through an email invitation. On June 9th, the EDAC will share a survey with our families and staff and students about their needs and understanding in the areas of equity and diversity. The survey will be available to all to help guide the district in a direction that will enable progress and address specific needs within our community. This survey will be available through an email invitation. I just want to say, and I, I've shared this with each of the groups, our Social Emotional Learning Committee and our Equity and Diversity Advisory Council, they are brand new this year. Uh, they consist of many individuals that, have, that come from many disciplines. Uh, they include parents, they include uh, staff members, uh, it includes a group of stakeholders that care immensely about the well-being of our children and our staff and our community as a whole. I cannot share enough as we come towards an end of the school year how impressed I have been with the individuals that have participated in the work that we've been doing. I'll just keep on going, that buzzing sounds going on. Um, but I will share this. And I share this at each of these meetings. For the past five months, five meetings, the individuals that have been part of this have taken it upon themselves to look into curriculum, to understand what we truly are about as human beings, what we truly need in our district, and they've divided themselves up into subcommittees that have been able to, that they have been able to detail out specific needs at specific levels. I have to share with you that the work that has been done in five months is work that looks like it was done in two to three years. It is unbelievable the investment that everybody has made and the empowerment that they have taken to really dedicate themselves to this. So for all of those, from all of the people that are involved in this, the EDAC and the cell committees, I commend you for all of your hard work, your dedication, and I, I look forward to what we will do in the future and how this will truly, truly affect all the students that walk through the halls of, of our Cedar Grove Public Schools. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I would also like to uh, just share with you um, from our uh, high school liaison uh, what is going on currently at CGHS. So uh, uh, um, it's shared that they're wrapping up their second week of AP digital testing. And as you may have seen when you enter the art, uh, when you've entered this um, auditorium, the, the art and design classes are holding their annual art show in the lobby. And tomorrow, uh, CGHS will be holding their awards ceremony uh, outside of the auditorium. This Friday, the seniors will be, will be participating in our first ever cornhole tournament, which will be sponsored by the ASC and the CGEA. And finally, next Monday, the baseball team takes on Verona in the rivalry game at Yogi Berra Stadium. Thank you, and uh, I've been part of both the uh, the EDAC and the uh, and the cell committees, and it's it's amazing in the short amount of time how much we have accomplished. Because when we were interviewing for new superintendents, 
you know, one of the things, you know, that we talked about are one of our, our top needs. And, uh, and obviously, equity and diversity were, uh, were you know, a, a year ago, you know, things were a little more difficult. And that became a, a huge focus for us. And it should have been a focus all along. But, you know, sometimes it takes an event to bring things to the forefront and you, and you recognize, you know, where you're lacking, in all honesty. So, you know, when Mr. Grosso started, we said that that's something that we really needed to focus on and it was important and we wanted to move the district in the right direction. And I think we've, we've been able to do that. We're not done, we got a lot more work, but I think we've made some, you know, some pretty good steps. So, thank you. All righty, moving on. Uh, from the Office of the Business and Administrator uh, and Board Secretary, under minutes, can I have a motion for B1 through B5? So moved. Second. B1 is a motion to approve the public and executive minutes of May 4th. B2 is a motion to approve the budgetary transfers for the month of April. B3 is a motion to approve the Treasurer's Report. B4 is a motion to approve the Board Secretary Report. And B5 is a motion to approve the Board Secretary Certification to the Cedarville Board of Education pursuant to the code that no line item account has encumbrances and expenditures which in total exceed the line item appropriations in violation of the code. Any discussion? No. No. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dechara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Under bills, can I have a motion for B6? So moved. Second. B6 is a motion to pay the following list of bills that were in our, our packet. Uh, any discussion? No. 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 Roll call, please. Mrs. Dechara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. I'm going to break up um, the items under business. So under business, can I have a motion for B7 through B9? So moved. Second. B7 is a motion to approve the contract with Wright at School for a before and after school enrichment program that was discussed this evening. B8 is a motion to approve entering the National School Lunch Program for the 21-22 school year. And B9 is a motion to approve the submission of the school security grant through the Securing Our Children's Future Bond Act. Any discussion? No. 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 Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Amiga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Can I have a motion for B10? So moved. Second. Whereas June is a time to celebrate our dynamic lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning community, raise awareness of quality services, qual quality services, and foster a dialogue to promote healthy, safe, and prosperous school climates and communities for all, and Whereas in 2019, New Jersey became the second state to pass a law requiring public schools to incorporate an LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum into their classrooms and whereas all children and youth should be able to attend school in a safe and inclusive environment, free from discrimination and civil rights laws contribute to such environments and Whereas the lack of awareness and understanding of issues facing LGBTQ plus children and youth has contributed to higher rates of school dropout, academic failure, and school disengagement. And whereas policies that specifically mention sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are associated with students feeling safer, lower levels of bullying, decreased incidence of harassment related to sexual orientation, increased teacher staff interventions, and a greater reporting of incidents, and whereas board policy 5756 prohibits discrimination in its programs and activities based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression among other characteristics, and whereas the rainbow flag, also known as the LGBTQ plus pride flag, serves as a symbol of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning pride and LGBTQ plus social movement. And whereas flying the rainbow flag throughout the month of June further symbolizes the district celebration of diversity and support for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. Now, Therefore, be it resolved that Cedar Grove School District recognizes the month of June as LGBTQ plus Pride Month and will begin the implementation of flying the rainbow flag at its buildings, all of them, during June to inspire equity, create alliances, celebrate diversity, and establish a safe environment in our schools and community, and that this resolution be distributed to every school in the district. 
I just want to commend my fellow board members and Mr. Grosso for doing this. This is a really big step for our district and we are better for it. And I'm extremely proud to be part of this. And it's, it's long overdue, so thank you. Any discussion? No. no. No, except just to echo what you said. This is the great thing. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Can I have a motion for B11 through B14? So moved. Second. B11 is a motion to approve the below resolution in recognition of the distinguished service rendered by Vanguard Medical Group, Verona, New Jersey, during the COVID pandemic. B12 is a motion to approve the location agreement with Cherry Tree Hill Media, LLC. B13 is a motion to approve Horizon Healthcare Staffing, a sub-nurse agency. And B14 is a motion to approve the extraordinary aid application. Any discussion? No. 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 Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Um, from the Office of the Superintendent of Schools under Personnel, can I have a motion for S1 through, a lot of S's. I'm still going. S21. So moved. Second. Okay. S1, second reading, be it resolved that the board hereby affirms the superintendent's decision in HIV investigation involving the student number listed from April 19th for reasons set forth in the superintendent's report to the board and directs the board secretary slash business, school business administrator to transmit a copy of the board's decision to the affected student's parents forthwith. B2, or, I'm sorry, S2 is a motion to retroactively approve the resignation for purposes of retirement of Phyllis Spinelli. S3 is a motion to retroactively approve Krista Matera to oversee math strategies. S4 is a motion to retroactively approve physical education coverage by Michael Musab and Randy Nelson. S5 is a motion to approve Gilbert Lee as substitute custodian. S6 is a motion to approve Gabrielle Garitas, MMS school drama production. S7 is a motion to approve Jessica Shoemaker as a CGHS girls varsity basketball coach. S8 is a motion to approve Gina Testa, high school guidance counselor. S9 is a motion to approve Jessica Tunath, reading specialist. S10 is a motion to rescind motion S6 on May 4th. Um, S11 is a motion to withhold increment for employee number listed. S12 is a motion to re-employ and set salaries for the tenured professional staff members shown below. Uh, S13 is a motion to re-employ and set the salaries for the non-tenured professional staff members shown below. S14 is a motion to re-employ and set the salaries for the tenured secretarial staff below. S15 is a motion to re-employ and set the salaries for the non-tenured secretarial staff members shown below. S16 is a motion to re-employ and set the salaries for the custodial staff members listed below. S17 is a motion to re-employ and set the salaries for the paraprofessional staff members listed below. S18 is a motion to approve the fall coaches for the 21-22 school year. S19 is a motion to authorize attendance at the following events. S20 is a motion to approve the following leaves of absence. And S21 is a motion to approve Nick Francosia, sorry, tech, tech designer drama stipend for the amount listed. Any discussion? No. 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 All right, well, we have a number of people coming and going, so good luck to all of those people. So yes. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Under curriculum, can I have a motion for S22? So moved. Second. S22 is a motion to approve the following courses for the 21-22 school year. Uh, any discussion? No. no. Just no. excited. This is yes. amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> Just excited. Uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mrs. Splendoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. I just want to say it's not often that we're actually smiling up here. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, under contracts, can I have a motion for S23? That's a really long one. Yeah, they, yes, so moved. Second. S23 is a motion to approve the following contracts for special education students as recommended by the Director of Special Services for the 21-22 school year. Any discussion? No. 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 Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mr. Spondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. 
Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. At this time, the Board of Education offers members of the public an opportunity to address issues regarding the operation of the Cedar Grove Public Schools. In this section, we allow public comments on all school-related matters. Our regulations allot 40 minutes for these communications. Again, each person shall be limited to three minutes. There will be a countdown timer, and at the end of the three minutes, the microphone will be shut off and the speaker will be interrupted. Speakers may speak more than once, only after all others wishing to speak on a topic have been heard. Issues raised by members of the public may or may not be responded to by the board. All comments will be considered and a response will be forthcoming, if and when appropriate. This portion of the meeting is meant to hear public comment, not to have a dialogue between the board and the person speaking. The board asks that members of the public be courteous and mindful of the rights of other individuals when speaking. Specifically, comments regarding students, district employees, and members of the board are discouraged and will not be responded to by the board. The public is reminded that students and employees have specific legal rights afforded by the laws of New Jersey. The board bears no responsibility, nor will it be liable for any com comments made by members of the public. Members of the public should consider their comments in light of the legal rights of those affected or identified in their comments and be aware that they are legally responsible and liable for their comments. As I stated earlier, all statements will be directed to me as the presiding officer and no one may address board members individually. Please be reminded that if your statement is too lengthy, abusive, obscene, or defamatory, you will be interrupted, warned, or your participation may be terminated. Please also be reminded that if any person does not observe reasonable decorum, is disorderly, or disrupts the meeting, you will be asked to leave the meeting. The board reminds those individuals who take this opportunity to speak to, speak to, identify themselves by name, address, and group affiliation, if applicable, every time you address the board, and to limit your comments to items directly related to the operation of the school district. Okay, and after all that, we have one person wishing to speak this evening, and that would be Mr. Canella. So I, I believe it was in October of 2019 um, when I addressed the board after I had made a request from the previous administration to... Um, pilot a curriculum program and, and th the administration had told me that that I was here and we were here and um, before I spoke I put on this hat to remind you that I wear many hats so today I'm here speaking and again I don't think even said, think I said my name uh, Chris Canella um, I'm here speaking today as a staff member um, and the advisor to the GSA um, and uh, Last time when I spoke with this hat, I, I was a bit upset that, that we didn't move forward quite fast enough. Fast forward a year and a half and I think you're almost catching up. Um, I, I can't express how much I, uh, what happened tonight really means to me um, as an educator, as an advocate for LGBTQ education, as an advocate for these students, and as a gay man. Um, I, you know, for the first time I really feel here. I feel noticed. I, I think our students are going to feel seen. And it really makes me proud about what happened tonight. And I want to thank all of you for making that happen and for, um, again, catching up uh, and, and moving this district forward. It means a lot. It means a lot for somebody who's, who's spent their career here, spent their life here, um, I'm, I'm approaching 23 years. I came out here as a teacher. When I first started teaching, I was in the closet. I, would, I, I, would, I didn't even know I was out to myself. Um, and so much has happened in the time I've been here, but today is probably one of the proudest moments I've, I've, I've been as an employee as to be associated with this district. Thank you. Um, there is one thing, just a mild criticism uh, <laughs> of the resolution. Uh, LGBTQ. We totally have it better. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm, I'm ecstatic. LGBTQ. The Q stands for a few things. Questioning, yes, also queer. And I'm more than happy, and I will ask my GSA kids as to why. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask if, if, if you'll extend the invitation for them to come and explain that and maybe a little bit about uh, what it means and why we have Pride Month. So maybe I'll, I'll bring them if, if they're uh, open to it in June. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And we'll get it right completely eventually, I think. <laughs> We're getting there. All right. I think uh, 
I think that about wraps it up for this evening. A lot of great things happened. You know, we've done some good. We've heard some great things that are happening, and uh, and we continue on. Our next meeting is in June, and then that's it for the school year. Wow. That's all I, I'm going to say. I, is, I have to tell wow. you, it's it's been a it's been a long year, and tonight was a great. Uh, you know, as we wind down and wind up, it was a great night. A lot of fantastic things were presented tonight, and uh, it was a good night. And, and despite, you know, the world being upside down and yes. things being put on pause and things being completely different than they had been, I think we, you know, we accomplished a lot in the, we did. In the last year, just from the presentations that we saw, from the students, you know, from the new STEAM team. I mean, there's still a lot going on. And uh, think about what all you guys can do, like, in a normal year, you know? <laughs> so... And, yeah. and, you know, and a big goal of ours, obviously, we've told the super this because we talk to him all the time, is when we were looking for a new superintendent, there was a lot of things that were very important to this board and uh, goals that we wanted achieved, and we really have hyper-achieved them in uh, such a short period of time. But don't worry, we'll come up with more. Well, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. We, we yeah, definitely, you know. uh, I, I think about... Mr. Grasso sitting in that right chair there. and us, that chair. <laughs> us spaced Socially out. Socially distanced, exactly. <laughs> screaming questions at him. <laughs> I have to commend those students that came up here and spoke. They spoke so incredibly well for public speaking in a year of a pandemic where they haven't really even spoken in a classroom much that it's most impressive what this, those kids were able to do tonight, I thought. Like, I can't imagine at their age getting up and doing that. Yeah. You know? So um, kudos to the teachers and the parents Absolutely. and everybody else who. And just uh, I'm a, this is like a love fest tonight, but I seriously <laughs> just have to thank our teachers and our administrative staff. And I mean, it's been a it's been a year, it's been a year. So thank you so much for your dedication to our kids. It's just thank you. Oh, one of the other things I just wanted to mention is also Lawrence winning the uh, and being you know getting the Unsung Hero Award is. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's bittersweet also because I've attended them as a representative of the Board of Ed prior to the pandemic, and it's a really nice ceremony where all the Essex County students, every school who, who's an unsung hero, you go, you went, went to East Orange School District, and they do this really fantastic presentation. You get to get up there and really be recognized. And um, I think the, the great thing about him, the young man that he is, is that hopefully he'll take this and it'll even he'll even improve even more as he as he goes along. But I think it's a wonderful honor, and it's just unfortunate that uh, he couldn't get all those little things that come along with it. But, yeah, um, I don't know. If, for those of you that aren't familiar with Lawrence, he's a great kid. He really is. I mean, I've I've gotten to know him through uh, from when you know my son was in the theater, and then doing the photography for the theater, and through uh, Jen Foose, and he's he's absolutely deserving of that. He's a he's a he's a remarkable young man. He really is. And one more thing, as we are like entering the end of the year and we are entering um, our awards and recognition and scholarships and for all of our kids, I just want to keep that positivity going. This is for the kids. They've had a tough year. And let's just support them all the way. We've got a great month ahead of us. All great things coming down in the next four weeks. It's all about the kids. And let's just make it great for them. Thank you. I'm struck by one thing, Ms. Mega, that you uh, you said about the the presentation and, and how it took a lot for you know the students to come up here. And one thing that they said that you know really sort of stuck with me um, was the slide where they talked about that you can be the bystander or you could intervene. And um, I'd like to think that you know as a board we've always been supportive. But as I think about you know some of the things that we say so we're supportive about that you know have we just not been bystanders and I'd like to think tonight that maybe we did a little more to yes. intervene so uh, so I appreciate that so on that note let's go home can I have a motion to adjourn <laughs> so moved second roll call please Mrs Dichara yes Mrs Miga yes Mr Spondoria aye Mr Schoner aye Mrs Dye yes. Good evening, everyone. The meeting is over. Have a good night. <laughs>